we do have factors that predict revolution and mm-hmm. we they they're true for almost all revolution and it's income inequality average wages and elite aspirants who are competing for good job and the thing is we built a computer model that looks at those three variables and it can predict historical crises to the years they operate starting from those three variables mm-hmm. and that computer model said 10, 15 years ago that we'd have a civil war in the 2020s Hi, I'm Rudyard, the what if altist guy. <laughs> Sean, this is Rudyard. Uh, I did think the episode was interesting, by the way. Like, I, I definitely sat in the car for a few extra minutes. What were, we, what, what were we, was it with the body language guy? Um, I think you were discussing, it was something to do with wokeness, which is probably what I was listening. Was <laughs> you, 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 I think you were defining the term or something like that. Yeah, I've done two episodes. Guys, the first was uh, I came on for up. a couple hours and talked to just politics and philosophy and stuff. The second episode, I brought on my friend Dan McKinley, who's an expert in reading people's body language. Mm-hmm. Okay, which I, got I, I a lot of one. a lot of feedback. A lot of people were saying the body language is like uh, astrology for yeah. men. Do you, do you have a take on that, Sean? I mean, I think most. I, I'm well, Dan's one of my best friends, and I'm not. Oh, do we have that. the same name? I think we have the same name. I thought, no, Dan and Sean are not the same name. Oh, no. Uh, what's your name? I'm Rudyard. Rudyard. Oh, oh. No, wow, yeah, I don't pay, I don't pay attention at all. No one has my name. <laughs> if you're named Rudyard, we no. don't... <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, somebody I was watching had the same name as me, so I was like, wait, was it... Was it okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm inclined to think it's not BS because I didn't actually see you provide an argument for it being BS. And the thing is, we know it is to a certain, it's valid to a certain degree, um, where, for example, certain facial structure coordinates with testosterone, um, certain um, body, like, like, you know, you run into a person and you can judge them in the first 15 seconds. And those judgments may not be accurate, but you, we definitely do judge people based off their appearance. And the fact that people put so much effort into their appearance means that it does validly show something about someone's personality. So we know logically that looking at someone's appearance, you can determine certain things about how their mind works. The next question, which is arguable, is how much that's predictive from that. I've been friends with Dan for a long time, and he has consistently done this with so many different people that I trust it. And I thought, I didn't really believe it when I first met, but I've seen it work enough that I do trust it. And frankly, the people who are commenting, what metric would they need to see to trust it? Because the thing is, you can't objectively prove what he's doing because you can't look into someone's soul and analyze that. Like you can't meet a person and say they are gregarious. You can't scientifically test if a person is social, intelligent, um, fun. I mean, intelligence is in real intelligence, not using IQ as a proxy for intelligence. Um, And um, so... I've seen, it's definitely better than average. And for the people who are test, who are um, people who don't believe it, I would hazard, what would you be looking for for that sort of thing to be able to believe it? What, what, what um, standard of quality would you look for for that kind of product to be able to trust it? And uh, are you rejecting it because you don't think it's possible or because um, you don't. You haven't looked at his assessments and think they're accurate. Because what happened for me with the cycles of history is when I entered the cycles of history field, um, everyone said it was BS. People said history has no patterns, um, that you can't look to the past to determine what's going on in the world today. And what I found is they didn't actually have an argument there. No one ever posited a good argument for why you can't use the past to predict the future. And I mean, it's just common sense past a certain point. Like if you were to look at the historic record and invade Russia again without thinking, you'd be a fool. Because we've had so many invasions of Russia that have failed that you think, okay, invading Russia might not be a smart idea. But then um, once you take that first principle, you can get some lessons from history. Then you extrapolate that outwards. And the next question becomes how many lessons you can get. And um, I think Dan's model is useful. I say this again with my theories as well. They may be useful heuristics to understand the world, but what I will not jump to is that like, I would not want someone to do, um, I don't want, I don't like people using tests to determine uh, 
someone's actual nature. I think people should use their own good judgment. And for example, in the same manner that I say, take everything I say with a grain of salt and I'm betting against God. I would say that about Dan's model as well, but I say that about everyone's model. Mm. Sorry, that took me a second to explain. That, that's okay. Sean, do you have a take on, on body language stuff? Do you think it's astrology so, for men or? It depends on, on the body language. So in general, there's probably things like, like you just said, that's yeah. Like you can determine certain features of a person based on posture, based on the way they speak, based on uh, some movements they use. But like, as opposed to as like, as for accurately determining everything about their personality based on what specific hand movement they use, probably that, I mean, they'd have to put a lot of proof to that. And it might change based on culture, based on the way the person, based on the uh, local area the person is in, uh, or even language differences and how you say things. It's like there, there are certain body language things that we use in uh, America that are different in Japan. Like if My, you're going um, to, if you're going to say like, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to say, uh, oh, are you talking about me? In America, you point to your chest. In Japan, you point to your nose. So it, are you going to be able to determine something specific from that? Or like, which one's more alpha? Which one's more beta? <laughs> I don't really know. <laughs> For a frame of reference, my friend is first an anthropologist and then a psychologist. And so my one of my top specialities for my YouTube channel is anthropology. And that's actually how we met. And so most of our conversations are at stuff that you're talking about, because the, the third thing you say, like blank is blank is true. Blank social cue means blank in Japan and blank means what in America. That's one of the things I find the most interesting. I'm actually the audio book I'm listening to right now is an audio book on how the Japanese social structure works differently from the American and how social cues in Japan are different from America. And the Japanese are fascinating to me because they're very similar to English speaking culture in some ways, because we're both very industrious, intelligent, high trust, successful societies. But in a lot of other ways, we're the exact opposite, where the English speakers are the most individualist societies in the world and the Japanese are the most collectivist. And so loads of social cues in Japan they just wouldn't even mentally process us here. Yeah. What's well, same with this book? Um, let me pull it up on Audible. Uh, Sean, what's kind of... your connection with Japan? Oh, I played anime and video games as a kid and started learning language. What? Death Note? I was, was re-watching re Death Note today. It's one of my favorite TV shows. I have uh I've only watched that show once and when it came out. Was it a good on was it good on a second watch? Oh yeah, I love Death Note. It's one of the few shows where I can watch it again and again. I love seeing, um, I love seeing. Uh, the, for those that don't know, it's a TV show. I'm not that much into anime. I've seen like five or six anime shows. Um, All the anime fans just got pissed off at you calling it a TV show. <laughs> I, I mean, you nerds can do your shit. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> um, but um, yeah, it's a TV show about. I'm saying it on purpose that time. Um, it's a TV show about a uh, teenage boy who gets a notebook where he can write the names of anyone who wants to kill and they immediately die. And so he starts to do this to, he takes this to become a God and his goal was to eradicate all crime and suffering in the world. And that he becomes megalomaniacal. And so it's this uh, really brilliant TV show about um, the attempt to discover him. And so it's all these mind games between the brilliant genius, um, investigator who's trying to discover who this uh, teenage boy is and the teenage boy himself in this game of cat and mouse but um the book i'm reading right now is the japanese mind by uh roger davies and osamu ikenu nice the japanese mind so it sounded like sean that you didn't like death note it sounded like you were dissing it um i mean i haven't seen it in a long time i just haven't had any interest in watching it as an adult it's yeah. it just feels like I don't want to say because it, it's kind of a spoiler. It depends on people who have seen it or not. But though it's oh. a really old show, there, there's a, a specific reason that happens at about the halfway point of the show. And after that point, it kind of um, gets bad enough to where I don't want to watch it. I know what you're talking. I love the introduction of that character. I think she's like... Oh, no, no, no. I mean, like, without spoiling it too much, it's a little bit past the halfway point where there's a, a second act to the story. And I don't like that second act. I think it should have ended with the first arc. Yeah, yeah. Um... I, I kind of get that, but also I, I don't take shows that seriously. I think it's mm -hmm. funny that it got cheesy. Um, and oh yeah, um, 
Although we can get off this uh, this anime subject. I no wait. Listen, I want to talk about anime. But um, I never get to talk with anime because Adam is a you boomer. Don't movie Bell. What are you talking uh, about? Look, I know one anime. Oh, I assumed you guys wanted to brought me on to talk about politics, but uh, or yeah, let's talk about look, anime. The I politics mean, Sean, of anime. Hassan yeah. went on trash I mean, taste um, and talked about politics. Movie, anime. Uh, Bell. Bell. Uh, no, I haven't seen it. It's one of my favorite movies ever. Yeah, it's um, I, I don't watch that much Japanese um stuff. But two out of my five favorite movies are Japanese, Princess Mononoke and Belle. And um, the thing I really like about Belle is it's set in a little bit in the future where like Mark Zuckerberg's meta happens and we live in virtual reality social media. But the thing is that it's um, it, it, it's like beautiful. It's like this absolutely artistically gorgeous uh, metaverse on like one Zuckerberg is giving us, which looks cringe. But um it's beautiful. And it's about this girl. She's digital Taylor Swift, where this girl, she's an oppressed Japanese teenage girl. And um she uh and she's um Is she like an idol? No, yeah. Like her personality is she's this beautiful idol in the metaverse. Yeah, she's like and a singer she, singer, right? Yeah, she's a singer songwriter in the metaverse. Okay, but, there's a whole like social commentary avatar. that's probably going under the surface about it's her that. Because idol, idol culture is really, really weird. Yeah. It's this avatar who uh, is super famous, but no one knows who she is. And she's this depressed teenager back home. And then she falls in love with this sexy werewolf. And it's like <laughs> this weird romance that occurs between them. I'm That's not going to for the rest, but it's actually one of the best written movies I've ever seen. And um, it really spoke to me as a Gen Z, as a Gen Z internet um, person, because I felt that same way where I grew up uh, in a small town in Pennsylvania. I didn't, like see myself as that important in high school uh and then my channel took off and it was just like this is insane and it's got it, it, it i related to that and also there's a lot of good commentary on digital culture because for her her audience love part of her audience is devoted senka fans and part of her audience hates her for she's an idol so she's not like she's political or anything just hates her i think that's a good commentary and just the irrational mob nature of digital culture and also how her entire life is digital. And I think that's the case for all of us, or maybe not our entire lives, but our work and the thing that we're known for is digital. And this world we live in didn't really exist before COVID. I mean, the world where you can work, um, date, uh, have your entertainment, do almost everything digitally. That's a very recent world. It's a very strange world. Well, mm -hmm. Can you really date digitally? I mean, sooner I mean, or later. If it was yeah. like Ready Player One meta first, you're probably, but it's going to be a lot like, of guys dating like other guys. 70% of the <laughs> oh, no. from Gen Z are digital. That's so sad. Maybe guy, guy I mean, with they voice changer dates they other guy. Or something. Mm -hmm. What are you're your... Right. Uh... Go ahead, look. Sean... I was going to say, Sean, I was going to say, Sean, the speciality for your show is dating topics, right? It's dating topics, uh, woke stuff, and I don't know, stuff that has to do with video games. Okay. Uh, a theory I have that you might find interesting is I think that the uh, dating crisis will cause a revolution. And I think that that is, it's, it is the number one driver for a potential revolution in the future. What do you mean by a revolution? Do you mean like a sex bot revolution? Yeah, like a technological or, or no, cultural. military revolution. I think there will be violent mobs in the street as cities burn. I think the sex, look... The sex bots, I think, are going to stave off the violent like revolution. Well, then well, we have we have a the technological. I don't know. I feel like anytime that the word revolution is used in history, it means people die or violence happens. No one died in the uh, industrial revolution. Well, I mean, people people lose yes, their jobs. Yes, they did. There's, there's destruction. People lose their jobs. Workers. So it's it's um, because arms. Think of think of you use, use go, go fully ahead, automated Sean. sex dolls to create. Um, to, to solve like the incel problem I, um, or whatever. But then you also have robots with working arms and legs. And so you would just use those to do other things too. In modernity, we always think technology will fix issues. Well, if you look over the long picture of history, the chances that you get a technological fix to a problem and the chances that um, society just falls apart, it's much more likely that society falls apart and you have a revolution than it is that you, um, the technology fixes things. Um, and you look over the course of history, revolutions, wars, et cetera, are incredibly common. Um, and in modern America, we try to do literally everything we can to not think about that. But the reality is that it's it's really easy over history. And I mean, my friend Samo, Samo Bersha of Bismarck Analysis did a research project on this. And the thing is, for sex robots, 
they'd cost like they'd cost more than a car. They cost like fifteen thousand dollars. And also, you know how much a girlfriend costs? <laughs> yeah, bro. <laughs> like, point taken. Come on, different. that's cheap. Um, point taken, but it's 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 different. Where like you want to get rich for yourself, and then the girlfriend comes along. But um, I, but also um. What I'd say with it is that people want to have love. They want to have families. Society needs to procreate. And our birth rate now is unsustainable. And I mean, we can do technology all we want, but the fundamental thing we need is people need to be falling in love and having kids. And as the, the, the birth rate is not a problem, though, if we have robot labor. Like, the obviously, uh, the engines replaced horses, right? Horses yeah. are not big. We don't use a lot of horse labor in America anymore. Like as soon as we have some sort of autonomous humanoid robot that they can produce. I mean, I think I looked up, they produce uh, 1300. I'll, I'll look it up. They've produced millions of cars every single year. If they can produce millions of workers in the same way that they produce cars, I mean, it's over. It's totally over. operating under best possible conditions on top of best possible conditions scenario thinking. And those tend to backfire where can our society accomplish anything now? We don't make movies. We don't make TV. We're not probably not going to make it through the next election. We're already on. <laughs> oh we we it's going to be COVID. very interesting 2024. Um, yeah, we can't do through COVID. Our economy isn't working. Like nothing in our society functions. And so for the scenario you posit, it first of all involves technological funding, which is dried up. Tech. Uh, tech funding dried up 70% in the last two or three years. It involves, means we have to keep our jobs. Um, it involves the populace not rebelling against these people because we're already automating enough. I think if we automate more, we're a very well-armed country. Why don't people just rebel and kill the people who run the machines? It involves said innovations not massively sparking inequality. And we're already one of the highest inequality rates in history. Um, it involves aging not rapidly destroying the world's economy beforehand and loads of countries like china russia germany are already at that place obesity as well obesity yeah and it's just it, it's it's like on a holistic basis you know there's a point where you're feeling emotions and you've just got to like cry or scream or laugh or like um go for a jog because you're so energetic because the emotions just build up inside of you and that's where we're at now where our society is all this pent up crap inside of it that we have to let it out and we're not going to, be able to accomplish anything until we let out the like feelings that are repressed in the underworld in our society. Well, Rudyard, Sean has about five minutes left. So if you want to ask him anything, this guy is like, like he knows YouTube <laughs> like inside and out. Tell me this, I don't know, tell he does me pretty well, though. I did look at his channel. He spelled YouTuber wrong, by the way. I did? But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Okay, Sean, what brings you <laughs> in this? What brings you into this world? What brought you to the place where you were on Sitchin Adams when we're all talking together? Noah Sampson and our yes. mutual dislike for him. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, he's a guy who makes video essays who's um, got popular after he, um, what's the what's the YouTube friendly way of saying this? He. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> you look. You don't have to say it the YouTube friendly way. We're all friends here. I'm going I'm to say dick rotting then, <laughs> a bunch of other leftists. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he became friends with Hassan after that. And then Hassan basically racks all of his content. And then he just blew up uh, in, in result of that. But on the, the same Hassan level, he does very, very little research and in, in anything, but also thinks he's the, mo the smartest and most intelligent person in the world, which leads to lots and lots of error. Yeah. So he reacted to one of my videos and said I was a liar, wrong, a misogynist, lazy, <laughs> all, this, all these, 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 yeah, all, all, these, <laughs> all these bold accusations. And then it's like he, because I there was this video, the Doug, Dove ad campaign, uh, they set a they cited a, a resource and it, well, they, they set a number. And I said, well, where does that number come from? And no, was like, you dumbass, how dare you not Google this? And I Googled this number in 10 seconds and found the study that it relates to. And then it's right. And uh, so I looked at it and I was like, the numbers don't match up. <laughs> They're different numbers. Uh, this study is super biased. So um, it, it's got ideology all over it. And uh, more importantly, the numbers don't match up. So I, I did a response to that where I found videos of Noah saying he only, he only like makes scripts in like an hour, does ba basically very little <laughs> research. 
uh, when he makes his topics. Um, this has not changed over the past two years, by the way, because he's gotten into a bunch of different dramas with other creators and I believe has lost every single one of them. Uh, so that happened. And then I made the video, uh, said he found the wrong study. I did more research uh, that took a lot more than 10 minutes that he did to Google the, the wrong study. It was about two or three hours, probably more than that. Uh, to try and find this study that Dove quoted about women wanting more rep representation and then uh, found that they never actually published it. Mm. So, and then, and then he did a bunch of other research about uh, weight, he, a bunch of other research that's right in my expertise, uh, my, my specialty, which is uh, fitness and weight loss and stuff like that. And mm. I was like, wait, you, you lift weights and you think you know everything about fitness. Like that's, that's just the basics. Like there's all kinds of things about biology, physics, chemistry, and things that yeah. work work into that that he doesn't understand and so he's looking at these studies like he's reading a foreign language and doesn't understand any of them and more, more importantly doesn't actually read them <laughs> so he's uh, making all these statistical claims and stuff like that and then i look at the studies and actually claim the opposite of what he says hmm. so we covered him on a sunday stream and he watched the sunday stream and i just reached out to him and said you should come on sometime i mean it's kind of the same way we met up with you rudyard right i mean i think we yeah. covered your you talked to Vosh. Vosh, I think it was. Yeah. And we yeah. covered your stream and was like, do I, for that stream, it's amazing. Vosh tries to get you on something and you said something in that stream that I still say to this day. <laughs> He's like, cite an example of something or other. And you're like, oh, that's easy. <laughs> and I'm like, that's such a good disarming comeback. And it was something, oh, that's easy. It's about, uh, Simone de Beauvais or something. Yeah, he asked me for an intellectual trajectory between the Frankfurt School and modern academia. And I said, yeah, that's easy. And then I immediately went about it. Yeah, I'm like, holy shit, this guy's a super genius. What the hell? <laughs> no, it's just that a lot of these people don't do any research. That's why it's so easy to defeat them all. If, if you, okay, so if you if you have ideological patterns and, and you know how to manipulate people and stuff like that, it's very, very easy to build a big following. But then if you uh, fight somebody who also knows that, but then also has the research, behind them you'll lose instantly oh yeah totally. gets, gets, gets ruined every time because it's like people like there are obvious flaws in what you're saying and people actually study this stuff can can give you examples whereas like on the the woke radical leftist end and there are obviously people the q and on people on the right who do this shit too um they go oh you don't know this read a book man and then i've, I've <laughs> oh actually gone God. i've actually gone to the point where it's like i've gotten told to read a book so much i'm actually going to read the book and i read it and they're like uh, well, actually, I didn't read. It. I just heard about the book. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's really like that. And I mean, I think that for dating, especially, the left doesn't actually posit an argument. I mean, I think people like Shuan Head do, but she's not part of the left anymore. And for, oh, uh oh, uh oh, uh -oh. She, isn't she all I right mean, now? All, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Shauna, has, come on. Intellectually Shana. on the left, she has been kicked out of the normie left. Yeah, that um, means she's all right. You, yeah, you're either, you're either I mean, with us or all right. Yeah. Like, let, let, let's fucking get the, get the, get the Look, she, I, she was on, on the show party. earlier, guys. Come on, yeah. let's be nice here. Oh, no, we're, we're joking. Uh, oh, yes, right. obviously. But but um, you know, here's the thing: but, is Noah Sampson called uh, Abba and Preach alt right, and Abba and Preach are very on the left. But that very, is very much on the left. Okay. Is that the normie left? They do not actually have an argument about dating. They have social shaming to say everyone who disagrees with them is misogynist, but they don't actually have a clear logical structure. And it's interesting to see for the left. I don't think the left is actually capable of. They have lost intellectual creativity. And this is something that you used to have to respect the left for, where when Karl Marx wrote Das Kapital, the guy did his research. He um, developed a 1,000-page book referencing Hegelian logic and structured the entire history of man inside it. And when the modern digital left makes an argument, they're just like, Twitter said this. And I, I don't... Yeah, and it's just... I, there are some exceptions. I think ContraPoint, and there's a handful of other video essays, they actually do do a lot of research. Um, but, I mean, what I see, the left doesn't actually speak to the dissidents or um, the counterculture on these dating issues. They shame them. They don't actually provide any feedback to the arguments. And what this basically translates to is that you can see an established order that's trying to use physical, that's basically trying to use force to maintain its power, because it thinks it doesn't have to be creative 
And then you have all these bubbling ideas inside the dissident uh, right, where Andrew Tate, Jordan Peterson, Fresh and Fit, they all have different worldviews and they're willing to talk to each other. But one of them has much higher creativity and much higher innovation th than the other. Wouldn't that be sort of more on the Jordan Peterson side where the, the left was generally the people who are open to new experiences and that's kind of a prerequisite to creativity and it kind of but sucks that we're losing it. that. Um, I mean, the left used to be open to experience, but since then, and I talked about this in the last- Oh yeah, you're right. They, they, the they first podcast, off. They've become religious fundamentalists and lots of psychological traits that you used to see among religious fundamentalists, you see among the left now. And the irony is that Religious fundamentalists are more open now because when I grew up and I'm from um, rural Pennsylvania, it was a conservative, mostly Christian area. We viewed the Bible Belt as the crazy area and we viewed liberals as more normal. It's flipped now where, yeah, um, yeah and um, and um, I mean, I see a lot more creativity on the right than the left at this point. It's to the point where I don't know what being on the right means. You have everything between monarchists, fascists, um, socialists, um, libertarians, Petersonians, whatever Andrew Tate is. And it's just it's this like bubbling pot of creativity. Well, the left is a handful of ever decreasing ideological unity. And you see this with um, I mean, I was watching your guys show beforehand about Ethan Klein falling out with um, Hassan, where there are people who. It was an ever decreasing amount of ideological unity. And then um, with this smaller and smaller group, uh, the Palestine crisis split it in half, where people don't know whether to side of Israel or Palestine. Yeah. True. Anyway. All right. Look, on that note, thank you for coming on, Sean. This was Sorry a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. me. Yeah, pleasure to meet you too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come back again. Obviously, you're welcome anytime. Definitely. All See right. you guys. Take time. care, man. Bye. Take care. So, so, Israel, Palestine, <laughs> anime. Actually, you know what? Forget that. What are these other animes you like? I want to hear about that first. <laughs> okay. Um. So, my favorite anime movies, I mean, I know Ghibli's not, I, I don't keep track of what these Oh, movies Ghibli are. doesn't count. Come on. I, I don't, I, if it's a Japanese animated film, it's anime, according to me. I'm a, okay. I'm a barbarian. Um, yeah. I love Princess Mononoke. I mm -hmm. love Belle. I love uh, Weathering with Weathering with You is a very good movie. Um, Machia is a very good movie. Um, then there's a couple others. I, I saw a Vinland Saga a couple months. What ago. about Kill a Kill? Haven't seen that yet. Oh, you got to see that. That's so super, what's that about? It's very visually stimulating. Um, it's about <laughs> a high school girl who's a delinquent who's trying to find out the mystery of why her father was killed and it embroils her it's an over-the-top satirical dramatic action series that i that involves basically magic clothes giving teenagers superpowers um that, here's, that's here's how you describe thing. it i don't like action movies Ooh, if you don't like action, then you will not what? like. How do you not like yeah, I don't like it's because it's it's kind of boring just to see things happen. I, I I like watching films with interpersonal tension, where you can see the like the characters. Oh, like, there's a lot of interpersonal tension in this. I, yes. Yeah, I like watching shows <laughs> or movies where like um, there's a lot of the characters have a lot of internal questions and they're like struggling with other people to figure out the complexities of their. Um, I'm a woman, basically. Um, <laughs> Um, when it comes to movies, that's I, okay. Look, that's I like movies I'm like not that. into rom coms either. Um, but like my favorite movie, Jacob or Edward, that's all we want to know. Uh, I think, <laughs> look, I've I never, think, I've never Edward, seen Edward's those much movies. Hotter, not gonna lie, he's Edward's more attractive. Wow, there you go. I've never but, seen, I've never seen either of those movies. Sitch has only seen them because he was trying to get laid, which is the, the reason you Twilight. should see those movies. I think I saw, um, my I, I saw Twilight and I saw Fifty Shades with my sister and we both grabbed beers to laugh at them, but they mm -hmm. weren't funny. Well, cool. yeah, I don't know if uh, Kill a Kill is, is it's like a it's a female coming of age story. There's a lot yeah. of personal drama in there, but it's okay. heavily action oriented. And yeah. obviously there's lots of skimpy outfits. I don't know how you feel about sex in your cartoons, but I mean, it's cool, I guess. Okay. Um, 
other anime I saw, um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I talked about Death Note before. I watched uh, Demon Crybaby or Crybaby mm -hmm. Devil Man. Um, mm -hmm. I, I uh, saw the Hurlick Legend of Arslan, um, which was an anime about uh, it's fantasy medieval Persia. And I started Code Geass, which is an alternate history fan of an anime. Um, oh, it's I can't stand Code Geass, but yeah, it seems like um, I. I go through phases where I watch TV shows and I don't watch any TV for a couple months. And I got a little bit into code GS and then um, I w entered one of my phases where I'm not watching uh, TV that much. Um, my favorite movie ever, I'd say is Lord of the Rings and um, Ben Hur is one of my favorite movies ever too. Um, I, I put out a tweet about this some time ago. I got to remember. I said the two other Japanese movies, I forget what my fifth favorite movie is. Um, it's yeah a, well i gotta do one of these tier lists on movies because it's so people always ask obviously did, did, there's a lot of good ones go ahead did you get to the you, part in code yes the kill kill japanese people part uh no i only got a couple episodes in. oh okay there's oh, a yeah. part rosemary's yeah, baby that's my fifth favorite movie what is rosemary's baby oh okay it's um, um it's, wow you have an eclectic taste <laughs> yeah that's um that's kind of my, what my culture like what i do i mean if you go through be like thinking sound and so i consume a lot more music than i do movies um because whenever i need to relax or unwind i listen to music and um i listen to so many weird kinds of music i listen to uh like teenage girl pop i listen to mongolian death metal i listen to like country music like canadian yeah. country music i listen to i, I got an anime music lately I listen to like traditional Celtic folk music. Oh, uh, I listen to um, like EDM. Uh, you like Melanie uh, Martinez? But um, like I, my musical taste is just incredibly eclectic and I collect, it's one of my hobbies is collecting weird genres of music. Mm -hmm. Melanie Martinez, are you a fan? Uh, no, never heard oh, of her. Okay. Oh, okay. Probably would be a fan then. Is that a teen girl pop? Yeah, basically. I think Maisie Peters is the best, uh, like, pop singer today. She's a kind of indie pop British artist. I like Melanie Martinez, and because of that, the algorithm keeps recommending Taylor Swift to me, who I cannot stand. Every time Taylor I hear Swift, a Taylor uh, Swift song, I think, I, how do I people think listen to this? Good. She's from oh, you like Taylor Swift? Oh, okay. Yeah, I like Taylor Swift. I, she's from Pennsylvania. She grew up an hour from where I did. And so, like, I knew people who Oh, knew so you're her. tainted. There were you're a couple, tainted. Like, there were, and, like, the thing, if you watch her old... I was driving one of my friends around my hometown, and he said this looks like a Taylor Swift music video uh, because she made this stuff like it's from Pennsylvania. And, like, she's pretty popular where I grew up. Like, um, it's her, or her country stuff. Uh, in Pennsylvania, it's... a. Uh, the uncontroversial party line is you like her country music and then you don't like her shift to pop. Um, and I think that's justified. I think her country stuff is better than her pop stuff, but I think her pop stuff isn't bad either. Where I think her 1989 album is like, she did a pretty good job on it. I think after that, it went downhill and I haven't listened to our last couple albums. <laughs> Getting the what if all this guy to talk about Taylor Swift. No, no, it's Based. awesome. Well, actually, not based. I don't know what I'm saying. How do you feel about Weird Al? <laughs> oh, I mean, so the thing is, people ask me how I feel at different artists, and for the most part, I know how hard it is to be an artist, and so I, I no, 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 don't give a pussy. Answer. Look, Listen. Weird Al, we all respect. He does a great job. I don't like <laughs> for the Weird grind. Al. Like the thing is, like I'm not jamming a Taylor Swift when I'm driving in my car or, or like rocking out. I think she's a passively good artist. I'll listen to her every once in a while. Weird Al's like that. I respect the art of his craft. What he has done has been admirable. I do not rock out the weird ad on the weekend. It's cringe as fuck, right? I mean, no. let's be honest. It's here. incredible that he pulled it off. It's so hard to do what he does, to write jokes and do like an over uh, friggin' song. And also exactly. going for like 40 years. That's but like, he's yeah. basically like the first uh, YouTube parody musician before YouTube was a thing. And he's the best at it, Adam. <laughs> well, just because he was Frank? doing it. What? Filthy Frank. Uh, is you that a of filthy Frank? I he's a YouTuber. Yeah, no, yeah, I've he totally did. heard of filthy Frank. Yeah. Yeah. He then became like a, one of the most successful, uh, Asian pop stars. 
Really? Yeah. You didn't hear oh, I, didn't, I didn't know that. Wow. So all of my friends watched Filthy Frank growing up. And um, there's a bunch that, of memes of him, but I don't know that I've ever seen his content. He invented the Harlem Shake, too. Right. Um, and so he did that. And then the thing is, he was actually destroying his vocal cords from uh, doing his Filthy Frank shtick so much that he couldn't do it. Or he had some other health issue where he physically couldn't keep doing the YouTube meme stuff. Then he became one of the biggest Japanese pop idols, and he became incredibly wealthy and successful across Asia as a pop idol with teenage girls as his demographic, rather than um, rather than friggin' um, like like the North American edge lord teenagers. Um, to change the topic, one of my biggest hobbies is I watch YouTube videos at the rise and fall of people in the content creator and world. And do you guys know who Little Z Lil Zan is? No. No. Lil Xanax. Um, he was a big uh big oh, I like the name though. <laughs> he was big in the SoundCloud rapper space. And I keep track of his career. I keep track of a lot of the careers of SoundCloud rappers as a hobby. Just I like I've got a lot of extra brain power that I don't use do, for do you have a spreadsheet of these rappers? I just or? keep it in my head. Oh, uh, okay, good. I was like, <laughs> that's a little too like, far. When I'm passively not being the what if altist guy, I have to devote my mind to something. Oh it's yeah. All, yeah. With, like of course. weird specialities of knowledge. Um, but Lil Xan, um, he picked that meme name. Um, then he had a single popular song. He refused to work. He blew all his money and partying and stuff. Um, as yeah, you do, as you do. Yeah, and it's just it's funny to watch his career because it's just like him taking L's every single step of the way, <laughs> and it's like it's a remarkable to see a person take that many L's. And like Lil Pump is similar, but Lil Pump had good music and he had like a more of a meme brand that lasted him longer. But it's also sad to see the end point of Lil Pump's career because um, because like after like when he went on the no jumper podcast he just he, would, he had done everything and it was depressing to watch him and i'm thinking damn i'm glad i'm an academic youtuber so i don't do this arc of <laughs> doing all these hedonistic activities and blowing my money and then having nothing at the end there's still time what do you mean yeah maybe i'll try to fit that in the next <laughs> we we learn from sean that once you start talking about how the algorithm is fucking you over your career is over so you you don't do that right um i'm actually a youtube partner now so oh YouTube no partnered with my channel and i have ambassador with them and almost all my videos at this point are monetized so i don't have beef with youtube but as of oh now. Wait, you said partner i thought you said departed no i'm a youtube partner where i'm oh part got you got you no yeah they have a program for YouTubers that they see promise in where they help you for six months. And so I'm part of that program because wow. they like the channel or they, I don't know, they see pro their algorithm. Why, look, why don't they help us? This algorithm is fucking us. <laughs> it's, um, you, you, it's, it's a, you have to be a certain size for it. Um, oh, okay. I got yeah. it. And so, um, and so almost all of my videos at this point are monetized. And I used to have beef with YouTube because there were points where like a third of my videos were demonetized or there are definitely points where I look at the algorithm and I think they're moving it because mm -hmm. for my civilization videos on what civilizations are, what goes on different civilizations, uh, the video in Western civilization is one of the least successful, which is insane because my audience cares the most about Western civilization by far. Can you look, we're, we're pretty good friends, Rudyard. Can you do me a favor? Can yeah. you do a video on MMT? I think people need to. Oh yeah! I, oh yeah! I'd love to do that. I'd love to make a video ripping. No, a pro. Look, it's got to be pro <laughs> MMT, okay? I mean, I, I, I gotta be selling my soul. It's retarded. Like, wow. oh no! Oh, oh no! Man, it's oh, literally one of please, the worst. Please, I take it back. Please don't make a video wait, on MMT. Wait, I beg theory? you. Look, oh, Sitch will wear a dress. Oh, wait, wait. God. One of you supports modern monetary theory. Adam is like I mean in love to find with, with one of the Look, worst ideas. Okay. It is the one of the worst ideas in economics ever. I am sorry. <laughs> Look, do, do you know you know Stephanie Kelton follows me on Twitter? I mean, <laughs> cool. It's still a bad idea. <laughs> I no. mean. What, what do you, yeah, explain to Adam what your problem, what your beef is with MMT. No, look, we can't turn this into an MMT. Yes, we look, can. No, I was, I was only joking because MMT is like death for your channel. Do not do a video on MMT. It's like the board. Nobody wants to hear about MMT. They want to hear about anime. Let's talk about anime. I mean, the populace wants to be fed money until they're broke. 
And then they vo- and then they voted various populists to blame it on groups. That's right. Let's talk about the end of the world. That's what we want to talk about. <laughs> Cinch, let's talk about the fourth turning. The time has come, Cinch. Okay. <laughs> I don't, why do I care? <laughs> Look, come on. What do you, the fir- <laughs> Our first question, Rudyard. Is there anything you want to talk about? I mean, you want you came in to bring me to talk about um, the political triangle. I, we can talk about that, yeah. Okay. Um, you, the the thing that I the question that I and look, we kind of talked about this privately, so I'm not even sure it's really. I mean, doesn't your audience want to know? Not really. I mean, okay, fair. I don't. I, I don't know that they're super interested. I'm, I'm mostly here to chill. Just I'm here to have a conversation, see where it goes. That's what I like about you, right here. Thanks. You're you're ready what, to what chill. What the fuck are you guys even talking about? What's happening here? The political triangle is something yeah. that people throw at us occasionally when we start talking about the political spectrum. Oh, that political yeah. triangle. Yes, yeah. Rud, a friend of Rudyard's actually made the political triangle. What? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, he runs a think tank, and he developed it as a side project. He's it's built into his philosophy. Um, he he and, explained it to me in DM, so I basically, I mean, I kind of understand it. And the chief complaint that I have about it, he's like, "Oh, well, that's totally, it, it's not. You're not meant to look yeah, at it that way." So the problem with both is that it doesn't fit into modern politics. But for my friend and I, we're our speciality is history and anthropology, and so we do politics as a side gig, mm-hmm. um, and. So the political triangle is meant to map every society in history, and the right-left divide is just a single um, edge of it. And also, each triangle is a different polarity of – it's based off the theory that humans have three interactions, trade, um, war, and sex. And so each of the polarities is trade, war, or sex. Um, So um... Maybe I haven't seen this political triangle so did you look it up, Sitch? Well, you've you looked, want, people have shared it with us a million times. I, Every I time I look at it, I'm completely trade. mystified by it. This is the one that's like got communism on the left, absolutism on the bottom, and individualism at the top. Look, I'll bring it up. I guess if we're going to talk about I'm, it, I might as well bring that's it up. That's the one I think people are talking about. Yeah. Is that the one? I don't see there's, shit. There's I, only one. Well, I, know I, I got to pull up the stream. Um. <sighs> Look, just send him what you're looking at, Sitch, in a DM. Or okay. can you do that? Oh, uh, no, no, Look, no. who cares? Let's talk about something else while I bring the triangle up. Um, Sitch, don't stare at the triangle. Ask a okay. question. We have, a, wow. we have a guest here. If you were to assassinate a single person on the planet today, who would it be? Let's see. Um, <laughs> how do you feel about dentists? No, I want him to answer the assassination question. Me? Oh, I, it's Xi Jinping. Easy. Ooh. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go for my ex dentist, obviously. So, look, what? sorry, there's no world peace is coming out of my assassination. <laughs> yeah. That's Xi good... Jinping, really? Look. Yeah, but I mean, would that solve anything? Aren't you? Why would you, you say that? Aren't you nervous? That guy's like now he's after you, Rudyard. I mean, I, I never said that they know I did the assassination. Well, they will now. <laughs> I know. I mean, I mean they'll think on. like some random like shit lord YouTuber said that. They're not gonna. Th- they'll think the CIA did it. They do not think it is within my capabilities to assassinate Xi Jinping. When you get the death note, <laughs> I know. He dies really, of a heart attack. They're gonna know. Okay. Uh, that thing would gradually corrupt my soul. Like, you I mean, think you I, would I, actually be corrupted by the death note? I mean, the thing is, if I see any magical evil object, I will naturally assume that it pollutes evil in its vicinity and that through using it, it will corrupt your soul. Because if you read the myths, that's what happens. If you get a demonic sword, one of my favorite fantasy books ever is about a guy who gets a demonic sword that like defeat destroys his enemies. And the thing is, if you have a sword like that and you don't think it's gradually corrupting your soul, then you are a fool. Yeah, but like, so with the Death Note, it doesn't actually, like, there's nothing magical that no, makes you No, but you will get Light's career. I mean, it might not corrupt his soul on, like, a physical basis, but it definitely mm-hmm. does through the process of that power. And, yeah, exactly, right. I mean, like, Light at the beginning of the show versus Light at the end of the show, they're different people. And I think that show's great. And I, I, this is one of the philosophic themes of Lord of the Rings as well, that normal people, when given power, can become corrupted. And sure. the guy you see outside Wawa... Um, give him total power. He might become Caligula or Stalin. Um, 
And this is something I don't think wokeness understands because if you're in a position of responsibility where like for me, I have to manage, if you're, you have to manage your business, you have to manage what you say on Twitter, you have to manage public streams like this. If you're constantly saying stuff, some of it's going to be good. Some of it's going to be bad. Some decisions you make will be good. Some we make will be bad. And that's what comes through a position of responsibility. But the thing is you run a nation that is a thousand percent, a thousand times more responsibility than I have. Mm. And you have to tolerate bad decisions among your leaders. And the left has no concept of that. And I guess the, the right more so is the right's gotten more schizo that like, because it's such a difficult job, Anyone, anyone in any position of power is going to make mistakes. And the thing is, if you hold them to a standard to never make mistakes, then you will have them do incredible risk mitigation. And people who go for complete risk mitigation is one of the worst strategies. Totally. The fear of yeah. making mistakes is one of the worst mistakes you can make in life. I mean, you think the, I don't know, you think the, that's only true for the left? I feel like both sides oh, no, are fine right, doing that. It got a lot worse for the right because right. Um, I, I look at the right now and they blame everything on the Jews. They blame everything on globalist elites. On the lizard. far right. Yeah, yeah. I'm assuming. <laughs> um, my, my father had a joke. Yeah, the anti-Trumpers aren't blaming yeah. everything on the Jews, right? Right. I don't think my, uh, my father had a Ben joke. Shapiro is probably not bl blaming everything <laughs> on the Jews. Unless it's positive. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> that's that's true. Yeah. You guys have the, the political triangle pulled up? I did, yeah. I, I brought it up and I started a DM group okay. with you and Sitch. So I'll can... try to keep this quick. So um Okay. So look here, let me give you my and I want Sitch to hear my critique. Yeah. Like I I look at the political compass. You know, you obviously you're measuring two factors, and when you move closer to one of those factors, you're moving away from another factor, but you're not really having an effect on the other axis. So, but the triangle has this weird situation where like if I'm moving closer to one thing, I'm moving closer to the center between two of the other points. So it, that doesn't make a lot of sense as far as a graph goes, but you're saying that's completely immaterial to this thing, right? No, no. Yeah. I mean, the thing is like, there's no they're all completely different and right. there's not, they're all the most polarities. Imagine my, my friend views this as magnets. Imagine you have three magnets and then certain rocks are pulled towards one magnet more closely than the others, but they're all different magnets. Mm -hmm. And the way I explain this is uh, I try to you, I, I talked for Sitch for a really long time in our DM. So trying to explain this and through that process, I basically found what's the shortest way to explain this. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what I'd say is that for these three markers, I'm gonna use the society that manifested them the most in history as an example. For um, communist access, I gotta make a, a what if altis video about this. Um, yeah, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking about that. Um, but the communist axis, this is the promise of something better. And my friend calls it the feminine strategy because um, it uses language and the promise of some better good. In the same way that for women, like their strategy, women are better at language than men are. And these things we found in studies, women have a larger vocabulary. They're better able to convince people to do things with language. And also for women- Is it language or is it that tight top? I mean, I'm always thinking it's <laughs> Why the is it top. The promise, which is it's, the, it's a combination of sex and language. And, and, and that's what communism is. Or what communism is, it's the promise. It's the combination of language with the promise of something better. And so it's the feminine strategy. And you look at the left, it's people with feminine psychologies for the most part. If you, you can correlate people with feminine psychologies with the left decently well. Um, and, and so Maoism is an example of this strategy pushed the most of the reason the Maoists are in power is because they promise a complete utopia and the end of suffering. The reality is mass slavery and death. And so theocracies are in this communism uh, feminine strategy. And so like Sitch and I were talking in our DMs about why. Oh, Adam, it was me. I was, ta you oh, were sorry, talking. Adam. Me, right? I was going to yeah. say, if you were talking to me in DMs, you were talking to someone who <laughs> fakes it. Okay. Know. Adam and I were talking in DMs and okay. uh, we were talking about why Islam Islamists and communists get along so well. And the irony is they're actually both shared here because communism, I say, is a religion. So is communism has all the markers of a religion if you study religion objectively. Islam's also a religion. So they're too shared. And for this axis, it's about motivating people 
through language and through um, the promise of something better. The next axis, the bottom right, is absolutism, which is authority. And so for this axis, you should do our agenda because it's the right thing to do. It'll help people. For the absolutist axis, you should do what I say because I will beat you if you don't. It is the use of top-down authority to um, maintain power. And the society that does this the most is Tsarist Russia 200 years ago, where in Tsarist Russia, everyone was owned by the emperor. Even the nobility were called themselves slaves to the emperor. And that top-down power held the society together. And um, the strength for the, the feminine strategy is that it's it's nice and it motivates people and people want to do it. The weakness is, is that it gets delusional. So communism fails. Um, the strength for absolutism is that it allows command in stressful situations. And we don't like to think about this, but authoritarian power is useful in stressful situations, which is why presidents, we don't, our society is not run by committees. We pick a single leader to run our society. And we also, it's why corporations are authoritarian, why militaries are authoritarian, where you're not allowed to question your officer. And so you can correlate the amount of military threat that society has with authoritarianism, where there are very few countries stuck in the middle of the map that are democracies. And, and so the societies that tend to be absolutist are countries stuck in the middle of the map. So China, Russia, et cetera, and the problem with this strategy, and the, the strength of it is that it provides unity and discipline. The, the bad part of it is that once you remove external feedback, you end up in a situation where no, the rulers aren't accountable to anyone. And that's the case in China right now, where um, Xi Jinping is a megalomaniac and all of his lackeys are incredibly corrupt because there's no feedback loop. Um, and then the third thing, so um, Maoist China, Tsarism 200 years ago, and for individualism, it's medieval Iceland. And medieval Iceland was a society where there was no government. There was no military, no taxation, no police. Everyone met up, all landowners met up in a valley and talked through their issues and had votes. And the way the legal system worked was that if you dishonored someone or hurt someone's property, they had a right to, your neighbors and the people who dishonored, you dishonored, had a right to destroy you and basically wipe you out. And Iceland, um, Iceland is, it, it's, I kind of see them as proto-America, where it was like Northwestern European peoples escaping oppressive governments, because the reason Iceland was populated was they were escaping um, the creation of, a, of the Norwegian monarchy. And it was all these people who hated monarchies and they hated power. So they set up Iceland as a society with no government at all. The problem with that is that Iceland collapsed in a civil war and it became this horrifying bloodbath because there was no centralized authority and the thing with individualism and like america is one of the societies that does the highest here is the strength of it is it's very flexible it unifies people it's very creative and so um if for the left they motivate through well, well if you do this it'll help people for authoritarianism do this or i'll shoot you for individualism it's hey if you do this with me we can both get rich and so it's a, a idea of mutual benefit and then that allows a lot of creativity and strength. But the problem with that is that um, it can very easily get predatory and there's no shared sense of structure. And so you often, one of the things I tell libertarians is that true capitalism isn't um, the fountainhead, it's landlords enslaving their tenants. It's people, in, it's ma true capitalism is slavery, um, mm -hmm. which is once you don't have a, it, when you don't have a legal structure or a church to counterbalance capitalism. And so it's these three polarities and the most successful societies have institutions that balance all three of them. Because once you can activate all three, you are capable of basically jumping between them. Hmm. Do you have questions, Sitch? Well, so uh, somewhat related. Well, okay, so how do you do feel about... Travel, so. How do you do feel you... about... Um, the the claim that people like to make, and this kind of fits in because looking at the, the triangle now about yeah. fascist and the Nazis being should being uh, characterized on the left instead of being characterized on the right. Um, I mean, I really love this chart because it deals with that. Because the thing is, they're in like the bottom. Absolutely, each of these axes shares something with. So, 
these are all distinct polarities. But the thing is, for each, any two of them, they ha can ally with another one over something. So right. individualism can ally with communism over the, like, they, like, the thing is, if you got these three people in a room, if you got these, if you got them together, for each of them, they could find something to agree with against the other person, against the third person. Mm -hmm. So if you got um, a classical liberal together with a communist, they could agree on the concept that equality is good. If you had a communist together with a fascist, they gave them the concept that this, you need to have a strong state to maintain society. And if you had a fascist together with a classical liberal, they would say that you need to have the strong win out in society. And so each of them can share things. And the thing with fascism is that fascism is a very collectivist ideology where the entirety of your life is built into the state. And this is something Mussolini said, where Mussolini said, I think Mussolini invented the term totalitarian as a positive thing, where he said, we want to be in a society where your entire life is the state and the state is like a family that keeps you warm and safe and provides all your needs. And, um, and so um, it has that, but also it still promises the people stuff, which makes it more, it, like, I, I think that it's on the spectrum and fascism has some similarities with the left but I don't think it is the left where fascism still offers the people something. It's like, still, if you work together, we can build a better society. Czarist Russia was not offering you anything. They were like, you serve the Lord, you serve the czar because it is your place as a peasant. And, <laughs> and so um, like fascism does have a similarity with the left in that it offers like a better vision of the world. If we all work together. Okay. But so, but do you, so you think it's, I know that it doesn't necessarily make sense with the triangle, but if you have to throw the them is, on the left, on right, this triangle, right. on this triangle, fascism is more towards, it's like, it's leaning towards absolutism, but it's got some similarities with communism. No, right, right, right. Triangle. I understand that. On I'm the just saying. Compass, it's on the right. On right. the political compass, I definitely think fascism is on the right. Okay. What, because, why? Um, I think it's, our left and right spectrum today is dictated by traditional versus untraditional and fascists are incredibly traditional where they believe that um where they believe that uh women should stay in the home they believe your loyalty to your ethnicity is the most important thing they think blood determines your personality they think traditions are the most important thing they think that um fascists put tradition above logic um they and they they think that the nation and just fascism is incredibly socially conservative depending no matter how you want to look at it and in our society the left right spectrum is socially conservative versus socially not conservative and the thing is that's like the the, the left right spectrum has got its <coughs> problems which you run into but i think it's still a useful way to view the world and in that way um and in that way like the fascists and the communists are clearly very different in that regard but also, I don't think that many people are classical liberals when a gun's put to their head. You look at a guy who said he's a libertarian, classical liberal, normie conservative. You remove everything from them. You put them through a plague, you make them poor. They'll, they're more likely to turn out being a fascist than a communist. And this is one of the things I've seen me is I'm a classical liberal. And that was the normiest position five years ago. And now it's controversial because all these people who are just normal conservatives, when stuff got worse, they ended up being fascists. And so you can see that there's there's this um, that once you put a normie left, a normie socialist under pressure, they can turn communist. Once you put a normie conservative under pressure, they can turn fascist. That's a, that's actually that's a very interesting and probably a good way to conceptualize it is like, yeah, if you put this person through the ringer, which side are they going to go to? And that yeah. that tells us something. Because, I mean, I agree with you that I conceptualize the left-right dichotomies, you know, sort of basically being along the change tradition lines. Where, yeah. but, but the people get very mad at me because they want to, or some people do, because the libertarians want to view it as like collectivist is left and individualist is right. And I think that's not the correct I way I think that's a shell it. game by libertarians. I mean... I have a very close relationship with the libertarians. Like I'm friends with uh, like the liber a lot of libertarians parties based out of Austin. So I'm friends with a lot of their leadership here. And I mm -hmm. know the libertarian presidential candidate. And he's actually a, a really great dude. Like I'd recommend, like he's a great guy. Um, but 
libertarians kind of play this shell game of, oh my God, we're a real political position. And <laughs> they're they're not really, like, you know, the political compass was developed by libertarians to make a different axis. Um, really? For them to fit in. Yeah, it was literally designed by like hilarious. libertarian political activists because they're uh, like, oh my God, we're not like the fact. That's fashion. hilarious. And um, I think there's a lot of real dishonesty in this field. And I think I stick to the ref- left, right axis because it's, once you break away from that, there's a lot more like chicanery that can go on. Mm-hmm. And so I prefer this triangle for all societies. And I prefer the left and right if we're just talking industrial politics. Well, I mean, I do think there are people now. I, I think they're the minority, but I think they're kind of disrep- uh, uh, kind of more represented on YouTube spaces. But I do think there are people that have an actual libertarian uh, principle and libertarian moral intuition. So I don't have yeah, a problem the, with them being on like their own, like Y axis. Yeah. And this is why I think the triangle is useful because um, I think the left right uh, spectrum is useful for 95% of the conversations mm-hmm. normal people have. I think it's, um, or if we're on, if, if you're on Normie TV, it's useful to talk about the left and the right as philosophic concepts. Because in our society, I can do my nerd stuff about 500 years ago, but in our society, like it, there is a left and a right, and it's pretty clear. And most libertarians would end up allying with fascists. Most um, anarcho syndicalists will find themselves allying with eco feminists. Um, and so. Well, what do you mean by that? You mean like if they it, have to so choose the between is, another extremist? In our society, the right and the left is, exists and important. If we have a civil war today, it will be, be between the right and the left. Right. Over all of human history, you might use – so my problem with the political compass is that once you start trying applying it outside of our very specific era of history, it breaks mm-hmm. down where Asian societies – Asian societies are often very collectivist, but also very socially conservative, which means they don't fit in the box. People talk about um, if Jesus was alive today, what politics would he have? And that's not a good question because like this is a really base take to make. The people who are closest to Jesus' politics today would be like Muslim radicals because they are the closest to the political and social context he grew up in. Right. Their world makes the most sense for like the middle because they're both from the Middle East. Um and so, like, Jesus wouldn't fit anywhere on our political spectrum. And so uh, that's my personal quibble with it. But the reality we live in is the right and the left are different factions that operate as if they are different unified wholes. Hmm. I want to say something before we move on from the political triangle. Yeah. So obviously there's, like, authoritarianism is on the triangle, and so is democracy. But one of the issues that I have is, like, I have a very... I have a very, I feel, useful lens for kind of looking at authoritarianism and democracy that I don't necessarily see being embodied in whatever the triangle is trying to illustrate. Like, I, I, authoritarianism for me is a very few people or one person making the majority of the decisions for society. And yeah. democracy is really an effort to decentralize power. So you have a lot of people buying in and making decisions collectively through democratic elections. Well, there's something that happens just technically. If you have a small number of people making decisions for all of society, you can basically raise taxes to 99%. Like you can you can subjugate people in ways that are you know, dangerous, I feel, for society. Yeah. And if if those people have any sort of political power, this decentralization of political power that happens with democracies makes that kind of impossible. Like I always use the example of, you know, the president of the United States. Is, you actually can do that. It, you you can, you do see democracies do that. Um, where, they're, I, where they're subjugating the people? Yeah, it's, it's common, especially at the further you get outside the West, where... Well, look, it can happen in certain situations where if you have a, a dominant majority that and there's no sort of Bill of Rights or anything, the majority can democratically... Uh, I mean, America pr- uh, pressed blacks democratically for centuries. And look at, like, the second we set up a democracy in Iraq, um, the sure, look, Shias just... both 
Dude, into... I, I under, look, I understand yeah. that you're like, there are exceptions, obviously. Just I think the broader point that this, there's this difference between democracies, and we can think of democracies as in the aspirational, perfect democracy. Oh, yeah. I think democracy is the best system. But okay. on this angle, I am definitely individualist. I mm -hmm. am definitely in this blue category. That's like, I'm really hard that. And of all three, of all three political parties, or I am politic the thing I'm politically closest to is a libertarian. Um, so, so, so I agree with just that. in the context of the question, like what is like what is this what idea does this embody in that same way? Like what simple idea? Or for this political triangle? Yeah. Okay, if you want to ask that in the easiest way, uh libertarianism, theocracy, and um and like um serve the emperor, those three. Uh, so what, I, what, what unites those things and what makes them like what, what on the triangle unites those things? There's no unification. Okay. It, it's like, it's three, it's three very different polarities. Like mm -hmm. this is a question you've asked me a couple different times. There's no like square, like for the political compass, each of them share at least something. For right. Here, they don't share things. Okay. So it's just like a way to, um, like on the, on the political compass, you're, you're, when you move things around, you're saying like this, this thing is getting less and this thing is getting yeah. more. So when you move things around on the political triangle, you're not really doing that. So, yeah, I mean, for example, with the political compass, I'm live right. I, I could be closer to off right. I could be closer to, uh, lib left, but for here, it's not, there aren't two axes. Mm -hmm. And I know the guy who made this. And so I can explain his philosophy, which is difficult to understand. But he views it almost, imagine there are three magnets in a room. And then the magnets have different power that drags them towards each other. And so, okay. for example, this his worldview is based on their polarities and everything, where there's a masculine feminine polarity. And some people exist at some point along this polarity. Donald Trump is very masculine. He doesn't have a lot of feminine aspects to his personality. Um Zoe Deschanel, very feminine, not very ma many masculine aspects of Zoe, Zoe Deschanel's personality. Um, and so it's, there isn't two axes here. It's these three separate magnets. And okay, some, that's interesting. Some societies are dragged closer to one magnet or another. But for example, the extreme societies in each case of Maoist China, uh, medieval Iceland, and uh, Tsarist Russia they are the furthest removed they could possibly be from the other polarities. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. Um, how do you feel about the whole party switch thing in America? The party switched positions or sides? I've got to run to the bathroom and then I'll clarify what you mean by that when I get back. Okay. Sure, no you problem. Let's uh, read a super chat or something. Sure. Hey, you guys, uh, Jay, I think Jay Reg is supposed to come on next, so. Nice. He's going to teach us how to be centrist. enlightened centrist. Yeah. Right, right. I, I look, I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Kenny X122 for $20 says, hey, guys, happy 300th. It may be my birthday tomorrow, but I'm gifting you 20 bucks to celebrate the milestone. S-Class is the best class. Well, we can gift you back a happy birthday. That's awesome. And A team is okay too, I guess. Well, happy birthday! That's yeah, wonderful. thank you, uh, Grendel. That for twenty dollars. Thank you, Grendel. Says, please ask Rudyard about the psychological black plague, particularly how it lines up with the current political paradigm. Is that like the sure. the other the historical black plague? I don't know. I guess we'll find out. I'll put that on the list. Uh, Christian Baller for twenty dollars says, Adam getting wrecked by Rudyard. Ooh, getting I'm assuming wrecked. that's regarding the MMT. Oh yeah, that must be the MMT. <laughs> I don't think Christian Baller likes MMT either. So no, he's not a fan. That's I, hey, welcome back. So can you clarify what your question was, please? Yeah. So like people say, like, oh, you know, the the South was filled with Democrats, and the Democrats were all like the racists, and then there was some magic yeah, party switch. That's kind of a bad argument. Like I think. Yeah. It, whether you make that argument is a marker of if you're intellectually honest on the right, because. Oh, shots fired at no, the I mean, it's, it's just Different people. I mean, I'm fine. I live in the South now. I'm fine with the South being responsible for slavery. Mm -hmm. We can say that. But like 
that's the South's cultural identity. And the thing is, it's the same friggin' Southerners. And one of the things that pissed me off the debate with the debate with Vouch, where Vouch asked me, um, because we were having an argument about um about he was saying the people who did the abolitionist movement are the same people as who do social justice today. And I said they're completely different demographics of people. And he didn't understand that argument because the people who pushed the abolitionist movement, um, they were mostly people from the Midwest or like nor the northern U.S. who were like evangelical wasp farmers. They were. The <laughs> yeah. And then the people who did social justice are coastal. And so these the parties change for whatever the culture and the demographics of America is where you can say the Democrats did racism, but it's really Southerners did racism and the Democrats were the party of Southerners. Then when the Democrats, because I mean, the thing that killed the South was, I think it killed the Democratic South was Lyndon Johnson pushing through um, the end of segregation. I think this is one of the most noble decisions that an American politician has done. I don't think we've given LBJ credit for it, where Agreed, LBJ yeah. sacrificed his entire party to end segregation in the South. And he was a Southerner. He betrayed his entire people for black people. And um, and so we don't give LGB, LGB credit for, LGB was a noble man in other ways. Like he pushed, I, I, I don't think the great society was smart in retrospect, but I think it was really noble that he cared enough about poor people to push that at the time. Um, and, well, people are going to say he only did that to get the black vote. Yeah, but he lost the like the Democratic Party of their time was completely dependent upon white Southerners. Right, so that wouldn't make so sense. So he's jettisoning yeah. right. two thirds of the South's population for one third of the South's population, and you can't win a single state in the South from black voters because black people aren't a plurality in any state in America. And mm -hmm. so, um, I mean, I think that that's a dishonest argument because the Republicans then got the South by basically pandering to that old segregationist demographic. And it's just like, I think that's, I don't like arguments that are based around technicalities where, um, I mean, people say the Roman empire fell within 50 years of Columbus. And I'm like, the Roman empire at the fall of Byzantium was a completely different civilization than what it was under Hadrian or Julius Caesar. And so I, yeah, I just don't think it's a very honest argument to say like the Democrats of today are the party of segregation because the Democrats have also since spent the last 60 years, their entire platform is being the opposite of segregation. The Democratic Party today is very, very different from what it was 100 years ago. It's like com it's completely different demographics. And you can say that the left is racist today, but it's racist for the opposite reason. Right. It's 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 um, I think it's silly. Well, it's interesting because like so when because when the Democrats were the party of the South and then there was kind of the switch, which I assume you're saying and I seems to be true with like that because of LBJ and, and kind of that stuff. Did yeah. other did like other people's policies switch to? I mean, my thing is that I my speciality is anthropology and demographics and stuff. And so mm -hmm. I would say that politics changes reactions to underlying social and demographic and technological changes. And so these politicians are doing what will get them votes and what are strategic as the incentive structures of the underlying society change. And what occurred with that party shift, because the thing is that after the U.S. Civil War for the next 80 years, American politics were operating under the same dividing principle. And that was northern wasps against everyone else. The Republicans were a party of northern wasps. And the top Republican states were Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Nebraska, and the, the Democrats were able to pull up votes together of everyone else. And so by the time Roosevelt showed up, uh, Irish Catholics, Italians were voting Democrat, Southern whites were voting Democrat, blacks were voting Democrat. Um, and so the Democrats, the Republicans controlled the country for almost 80 years straight after the Civil War because Northern wasps were so much of the country that you could just win every single election. And what Roosevelt did that was so remarkable was that he built, he was able to add enough people together that the coalition of non-Northern wasps could finally um, overwhelm Northern wasps. And um, what occurred then was, and I think this is actually the reason we're, why multiculturalism is our society's big thing. The Democrats realized they could hold on to power by basically building a coalition of everyone who wasn't the mainstream. And you look at the left today, they're the same strategy. Their strategy is to hold on to power by 
creating an alliance of everyone who's not mainstream. And um, so for the time before, um, for the time that we're talking about where the South was racist and was KKK, the dominant political divide in America was North versus South, and they would fight over the West. And now the divide is, um, now the divide is coast versus interior because the underlying incentive moved from the North and the South being super different societies to in a globalized world, the, the game is, do we pick, do we try to adapt America to a globalized world more or do we try to maintain America's like social independence more? And so it's a rural versus urban divide. So it's a completely different thing based off the world order fundamentally changing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but like, so with Roosevelt, it's kind of interesting because, so he's, you know, Democrat, obviously, this is yeah. pre-LBJ, yeah. um, but the policies, the economic policies he would be pushing for would be considered very left-wing by today's standards. So yeah. how does that mesh with the party switch idea? Um, I mean, the left completely jettisoned economic issues because what happened, the left can only get the working classes and societies where the working classes are poor. Um. And so the left has only gotten consistent support from the working classes outside of unions um, in countries like Russia or China, where the working classes are starving peasants. But the, the irony is that once you get to wealthy industrialized societies like Germany, America, whatever, the working classes tend to go conservative. And one of the interesting ironies is that the wealthier society is, the more it is to go fascism, the poorer it is. Almost all wealthy societies, when they go authoritarian, go fascist. Almost all poor societies, and they go authoritarian, go communist. Wow. And okay. um, interesting. And so, what the left did was they realized they weren't going to get support by the working classes, but the left was actually made up of teachers and academics, and so they switched their support base from the working classes to um, ethnic and sexual minorities, and that was a really smart strategy because they, like, they would have failed with the working classes. But also women gained mass importance in society. And so through picking women, um, they were able to just get a lot of social power, but they were also able to ally with large bureaucratic structures. So the left that today you see is that it's, um, I mean, the left has all the big companies. Look at the World Economic Forum. Look at any left-wing sponsor in Amazon, Chinese Natural Petro- National Petroleum. Um, Smith & Wesson. Oh, Smith and Wesson, like, um, I mean, it's just all these, like all the big, like every Hollywood company, every Silicon Valley company, um, mm-hmm. are all left leaning and their left was the left abandoned economic issues because they stopped seeing the working classes as useful. And so it moved from economically left wing to socially left wing. And so it's, it's a party shift, but the underlying things the left cared about changed. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I tend to agree. It was exactly that you know after it's, the reagan it, revolution they were like shit we, we yeah. you know we're, the working people are not supporting us anymore and so it definitely seemed to be the case i mean it's funny that you like i saw this clip of someone talking about eisenhower campaign platforms mm-hmm. and they were very socially left-wing and like if you if eisenhower ran today he'd be called a rhino um and eisenhower is actually one of my favorite president presidents ever so that's sad but i mean another fundamental reality was that for most of history, the rich treat the poor like trash. The World War era was special because they needed the poor to die in war. And so um, eras in which there's a total war tend to have really high cohesion and treat the working classes very well because they need the working classes for the country to survive. They need to fight in war. But the thing is, once we remove the threat of external war, um, we've gone back to the social norm of the upper classes oppressing the lower classes. Right. Okay. Uh, someone asked, I don't know what they're referring to. They asked, they want us to ask you about the psychological black plague. Oh yeah. What I made an hour long video about that. Mm-hmm. What is that? I mean, what do you want me to say? I mean, what I, I, don't know. What I just, what is it? What is it? Um, it's, um, I don't like shortening hour long arguments, but the oh, short okay. <laughs> is I've looked at a bunch of stuff yeah. where I say that, like Europe before the Black Death, what was going down was that they would live near their own shit. They'd sleep naked in the same bed. They wouldn't clean wounds with soap. Um, they didn't have a concept that like filth would spread illness. So the mm-hmm. Europeans subconsciously or the Europeans unwittingly 
set themselves up in a position where a giant plague could wipe them out. And in that video, I say, we've done the same thing for mental health. And that was a really fun video mm. to research because I, I looked across a bunch of disciplines. And what has come out of psychology recently is that we found that the things that make people the happiest are religion, community, or religion and community. And um, material gain tends to not make people that happy. Or it, once you're out of poverty, there's a big shift. But once you move from middle to upper class, there's very little happiness gain. And what I say is that due to the collapse of um, religion, community, beautiful art, a uh, sense of meaningfulness in life, um, pe most people are economically unstable is that we unwittingly set ourselves up for a psychological pandemic. And I argue in the video that um, psychological pandemics are real things. And the best examples of it are like Stalinist Russia, Nazi Germany, the French Revolution, where an entire society went crazy for a short period of time. And everyone reasonable can agree that those were bad ideas. But people just went nuts for a little bit and they lost their better minds. And I say that when a society is not properly set up for it, the entire population can go crazy. And I predict that that's going to happen to us where just the population is going to go mad in some way or another. And I mm -hmm. think that I compare it to the Black Death because the Black Death halves Eurasia's population. And what this is already doing is having our world's population. Because the thing is, people aren't having children. And that's fundamentally a cultural and psychological problem where in the third world, people can have five kids in the same crappy tenement. And to be fair, I don't want to have kids now. Like, I, it's why, reasonable. Why is it a problem? Like, every time I people say that. Because it'll start killing countries. You can't survive with a, with a declining population. Like, look because? At Japan. In Japan, it happened. It, Japan beforehand was the wealthy, one of the wealthiest countries in the world, one of the most technologically advanced. People literally thought Japan would take over the world. I mean, look, you, you, you agree. Look, you agree. There was a, a time when people said that overpopulation was going to cause everyone to starve, right? And then they came up with oil-based fertilizers and new ways of farming that completely changed everything. I just, I feel like uh, automation, humanoid robots are going to be that change. That is just, it's like, it, it doesn't matter if people have kids anymore. Societies can adopt changes like that when they're unified. And this is one of the things with the Turchin cycles where it's, it's, it's completely, look, they didn't, Society didn't choose to adopt oil-based fertilizers. Like it's a, it's a technological development. But the thing is a society that does develop those things is a strong unified society. And so you look at the Turchin cycles and it's really shocking how much technological and social progress adds up with them. And I'd agree that if I was in 1950, I would be terrified of overpopulation because that would be a completely reasonable thing to be terrified of looking at the numbers. Mm -hmm. But because we were doing well in Turchin's in Turchin statistics, where we had a unified, coherent society that could make plans, we were able to develop technological innovations to deal with it. But at, what I see now is that we are incapable of implementing anything in our society because we're so divided. And so even if we had those robots, which even if we had those robots, we're already so broken that what would end up happening is that one faction would end up using it to support their faction at the expense of the broader society. If well, we, obviously, you have to work on that. That's terrifying. I mean, I mean, the thing is, if those robots were invented, we all know that they would be like brought out by Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos. Well, they're both in favor of UBI. So you're they would be look, immediately you're... used to oppress the population more. No one who is developing those technologies no. would not use it to oppress the population. I don't, I, I don't think so. Like, why would the, both those guys be in favor of UBI? You mean militarily or economically? They like UBI because they want the public to be fed grains so that they're docile. What do you mean by oppress the population? Um, anyone who has the power to develop those kinds of technologies would use it for bad things as a mm -hmm. way to replace employees and drive right. people further into poverty and do further inequality. The, the, this is a reason that they're in favor of UBI is because both those guys know that this narrative is closer to a reality than most people think. They're in favor of UBI because they want it to happen and they want a population fed off bread and circuses that's docile. They want to get progressively <laughs> richer without a revolution. Look, I'm I'm no fan of of Zucker or or Bezos. 
but the idea that they want to subjugate the population, I don't know. That's they're that's not going to consciously. They don't want to. That's a big claim. That's they don't a want big to claim. consciously subjugate the population. I don't think Zuckerberg thinks up in the morning. How do I oppress the poor more? Um, <laughs> but, um, but um, what ends up happening is that you create incentive structures where that ends up occurring. And Do, I don't look if, if Zucker I, could make Zucker wants to make money. I think we can both agree on that. If yeah. Zucker could make money in a way that was morally awesome or a way that was morally questionable. I, I mean, you could make an argument that Facebook is morally questionable because it's getting all these young kids hooked on social media. Yeah, I think that weighs on Mark Zuckerberg. I think he wishes that his comp his company was making money based off something that was more better was morally better for society do you think, do you disagree with that i mean what i'd say is that raise it we have one of the highest rates of inequality ever in human history now and the thing is i say the what the reason i say that is that we've hit this threshold like 10 times before and it's always the same threshold because once you get beyond this threshold society falls apart um and you can't sustain much higher inequality than what we have without society falling apart and i don't support I frankly don't support the very, very wealthy getting richer in any form, because the thing is, once you get a society where a handful own everything and most people don't, is that the rich throughout their own conscious intention will naturally grow incredibly arrogant and disconnected and view the population with contempt. And then the population will grow slavish and docile. And um, and this is what the founding fathers talked about a lot, where you don't want to have a society where um if the population has no agency because of extremely high inequality, they're going to start playing video games and being angry and not caring because that's the rational calculation. And if there's a handful of very smart people who own everything, they're going to become megalomaniacal because that's the calculation. I see that with them. Um, I look at the World Economic Forum where they say, eat bugs, um, you will own nothing and be happy. And the thing that scares me about that is that they don't realize how much the public hates it when they say that. They are that isolated and disconnected. The Do, I, look, I don't know who's actually saying that. I've heard a lot of people say they're saying that at the World Economic Forum. Go onto their website. It, they literally, like, they have quotes on this stuff. And it's uh, like bug-based protein or something? I Look, I do, is that really a thing? They, they say it's a thing. And the reason that they want to push it is concerning. And the thing is, it, there's I, I don't see a way where you if Mark Zuckerberg gets much, much richer, he's just going to become a monarch and he's going to act despotically. And um, he might not want to consciously he might not want to consciously control people, but he will start sucking up so much of the air in the room that it will destroy freedom for other people. They're super worried about climate change. So that is probably why they're doing the eat the bugs thing, because they're saying cattle are causing too much co2 yeah. or something to that effect i just think they're i mean i view this in historic terms right before collapses you have this situation where there's um an elderly emperor who's surrounded by eunuchs and harem girls mm -hmm. and that's our society the leads today are elderly or child emperors who know nothing surrounded by our equivalent of eunuchs and harem girls are people who got their position because they knew how to play the game inside the power structure. They don't know what life's like for the poor. They don't know how to wage a war. They don't know how to launch a new company. And then what ends up happening is as the elite gets more and more disconnected, um, that just they lose power and society falls apart. And this is a natural historic process. And I mean, you guys know um, the air, the last airbender, Bossing Se? Oh, well, I do, yes. Yeah, Bossing Se <laughs> is in the last I mean, airbender. I know of it. <laughs> yep. Ba Sing Se is the city in the last airbender and their China proxy empire, the Earth Kingdom. Um, the, it's Ba Sing Se is so disconnected from the rest of the empire that the emperor doesn't even know that there's a war going on, but the war is destroying the entire city and he's under siege. And that sort of thing actually happened in Chinese history a couple of different times where the emperors had no idea the peasants were starving or they had no concept that, um, that uh, their society was falling apart. And mm -hmm. like they're literally Chinese emperors who were so drugged up on opium with harem girls that they didn't know the city was under siege. Um, <laughs> that happened a couple of times. And Jesus. do not ascribe to malice what can be ascribed to idiocy. And the thing is, with these World Economic Forum types, I'm a 22 year old with no degree. If they hired me, I could tell them this stuff is cringe. This is idiotic. The public will hate you for this. 
they hired marketing degrees to tell them what they wanted to believe because they're that disconnected because wealth and power to that great an extent naturally breeds disconnection from reality. And that's why, that's why the elites are the way they are. E even if Turchin is correct and there is, you know, we're on the verge of some great historical climax here on the, on in line with like second world war or, the yeah. Civil War or whatever. Like, ultimately, both those things we survived from. And look, we've got a great society going here. I, I don't think this is going to be the apocalypse. I don't think this is. I mean, I've coming. never said it's the apocalypse. I've never okay. said the world will end. I always say this is the historic crisis on the scale of the French Revolution, Black Death, um, uh, wars of religion. And I make that explicitly clear in my videos that this is a crisis on the scale of these previous historic crises we've seen centuries before. And I've mm -hmm. said in previous videos, I think this century will actually be America, we'll have a golden age in the middle of the century. I think America will remain the world's dominant power for this century. Um, East. Yeah. S Sitch is, look, Sitch is super skeptical that anything bad is going to happen. I'm, I'm more open to, to the idea. What would, what would convince you? I'll ask both of you. I'll ask, you know, um, Rudyard, what would convince you that catastrophe is not going to happen and that everything is going to be fine in Sitch? What would convince you that more see, towards Rudyard's position, I that, would like see, everything is going to fall to believe apart? That, I would need to see a rapid increase in wages and a rapid decrease in inequality. If oh, I that's easy. That, that's done. <laughs> really? We can do that. Sure. I mean, if yeah, we, UBI. If we saw that. If we saw that, I would release a video. Thank God, things are going to be okay. Um, that's what I need to see. Um, because I think politi the political polarization. I would need to see insane political radicals lose power, and then the economy getting better for normal people. And then I'd be like, "Cool, we're going to be happy. I'm chilling. Let's grab some beers." So when Sitch? you talk, well, no. So well, my question is, when you talk about like things are going to like be catastrophic but then in the mid-century things are gonna be good like what is what does it look like like what is the catastrophe um, and then what is the good my best prediction and i've done hours upon hours of content mm -hmm. i think america will have a brief civil war where the right crushes the left i think i i could see a scenario where basically right-wing thugs like basically go around new york and los angeles and kill leftists the left wow. is wiped out the right splits and turn into warlord factions and then there's conflict inside the right between different factions on the right then that civil war ends at a after like let's say a couple years 10 years society enters a new um governance system possibly a dictatorship the dictatorship under the dictatorship there's a new golden age and with the psychological black death it's that you see like just, just to be clear those leftists are going to be the anti-israel nazi types that we're seeing now right <laughs> i just <laughs> yes okay good I mean, they'll probably kill reasonable leftists too, because once you have purges, <laughs> once like purges are not reasonable. Once they right. have, and like I go on right wing Twitter every day, and I see this obnoxious shit. And I'm sorry that like I'm sorry to derail the question you asked, Sitch, which is interesting. Actually, no, Sitch, please answer. I'll go. Oh no, I want to hear your derail first. Okay, so on Twitter, I posted. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, damn, I got to disconnect from Wi-Fi on my phone. I'm in my office right now, which is on the other side of the house from mm -hmm. my uh, from my Wi-Fi router. So just okay. Just give us a gist of it. What okay, it? I got this tweet. Um, this is what I said to my Twitter. My number one guide to the new right today is just have a fucking heart somewhere in your body. I'm not saying be a bleeding heart liberal who's constantly being triggered, but being the opposite of your enemies is not a viable strategy. I see on the new right a complete lack of empathy for any suffering. This isn't a problem now since the new right has no power, but if it does, don't let resentment take control of your better judgment. Resentment is a dangerous <laughs> emotion. It really it's is. 400,000 views and all the comments are calling me a cuck. And like they're all like you oh, are that's awful. Right. Oh, that's awful. Oh, all the comments awful. are like we like you are a horrible person and you are weak for saying we should not be filled with resentment and have some humanity. And it's just four hundred. That's not people. good. That, this is where I would hope Christianity would come in and be like, oh yeah, we should and, have some I mean, empathy. For frame of reference, the new right tends to like me. They, they view me as like based guy who doesn't like the establishment. I have goodwill among this demographic. 
And mm -hmm. they're calling me a cuck here. And um, then my reply to that was my last words before my break from this app, because I'm taking a break from Twitter for uh, a couple of weeks. Um, here's my outtake reading the comments. Congratulations, you've all sold your souls to the devil. Um, and I mean, it's just like, it saddens me where you have an entire demographic of mostly young men where they view the concept of humanity as gay and they view the concept as of the, not even like, I, I understand some people are brutal, but they like the concept of humanity. There are communists who like, okay, we're going to kill millions of people, but love is still a good concept. I support the concept of love. Once you hate the concept of empathy and love, you're in a bad place because you've lost any feedback loop towards good morality. And um, it's just, I think that's really frightening. And people say like, my generation is soy. No one who's a Zoomer can fight. They don't have to. You need to have a small group of radicals who is capable of organizing well. They fight, and then they drag around, then then they draft other guys and force them and give them guns. Um, and it's just we already have a demographic of incredibly aggressive, violent young men. Mm -hmm. Do you think that because I know the contingency of people that you're talking about, and yeah. I kind of in my mind, I look at them as like you know they're the mirror image of the Hassan watchers and all that stuff. And, and to me, that is frightening because this is the generation that's growing up. Um, but like, I don't think that that's the majority of the people. It doesn't have to be a majority. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, the thing is the Jacobins who were the guys who ruled France um, they're after the revolution. They were less than like 3% of the population before the revolution. The Bolsheviks were again, and communists were like less than three to 5% of the population. Mm. These are tiny parts of the population that are uh, Christians also. Christians were 5% of the population of where they converted the Roman Empire. And so these can often be tiny parts of the population who are the best organized, who know right. are in the right place. And they just YOLO it. But because no one else can hit their critical mass of people ready to die for a cause, mm -hmm. um, they win. And that occurs again and again. And Nassim Taleb has got this principle, skin in the game. And... Um, I mean, one of the things for me, and I, one of, this is one of my goals for the channel, is that when you read history, I'm tired of seeing the good guys lose all the time. Because if you read history, it's normally some horrifying band of thugs beats another horrifying band of thugs. And it's dispiriting. <laughs> and it's just, we're in a position in time where we are seeing this form right now. And um, it's just, it's sad to see this process happen again. And I, I talk to these people and I try to give them humanity and say, hey, if you do all these horrible atrocities, you will regret it for the rest of your life. And if you don't, your kids and their kids will very much regret it. And like, I don't give a fuck. Like the left is gay. And I'm just like, you are just proving my point. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, we, it's fortunate. We, we have like this contingency of people who are just so angry at everything. So disconnected from other people that I guess it just promotes this burn it all down I, um, uh, mentality. And yeah, I mean, you're, you know, you can't, you're not going to be very difficult to, to convince those people to have like love and empathy. I mean, what I, my friend, uh, cat girl Kulak, who's a, a military Twitter, tweeter, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, he made this really funny tweet, which is the top tweet to it. The purpose of a heart is to pump hot blood at speeds. So you can participate in combat. The limbic system controls emotion and oxytocin regulating a empathy. What causes oxytocin release? Oh, that ain't happening. It's not even no no nut road November, where he talks about how he shows this clip where oxytocin, the chemical behind empathy, is mostly released through sex or through having like being with a baby. Um, and I mean, I talked to this for the longest time. People called me out until it was correct that I looked at the stat that a third of men are 30 are virgins. And I said, that's revolution fodder. People are like, oh, that's schizo right here. I don't believe that a third of men under uh, like this young male sex epidemic could cause a revolution. But I've been mm -hmm. saying this, that if you have a giant demographic of young men who aren't getting laid, they're just going to start a war. And this is a process you've seen dozens of times before in history. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, Yeah. So I guess to answer the question, I don't to like, what would make like, it's kind of easy for me, I guess, to answer the question. Maybe it's unfair because I'll say, well, when it starts happening, I'll believe it. <laughs> right? like, yeah, I mean, that's the nature of life. Um, unfortunately, yeah. We all have to make our calls where it's like, I accept that I may be incorrect here. 
but also I've got to live my fucking life and move on to the next day. And um, I had a friend talking to me today and he said, hey, Rudyard, why don't you study Atlantis and um, ancient archaeology and ancient Ice Age civilizations? And I said, I don't care. I don't care enough to study them. He's like, but you could turn out to be wrong. And I said, okay, if I turn out to be wrong, I'm wrong. But right, I don't right. care enough to make this stand here. Yeah, because well, it's just two lines. Mm-hmm. What were you going to say? Well, it's just, I guess, a, a long... Like, if you say, like, okay, like, what is going to convince me that this, you know, the revolution will happen? I mean, I, I guess, actually, you know, to, before it actually happens, for me to see the kind of energy mobilizing in the streets, because it's going to start small, I imagine. It's going to kind of start small and get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, for me to see that start, and then for the police, the mainstream, for politicians, to basically just accept it or promote we did that. it. It's called and, Chaz. Well, yeah, but that was like, who, I mean, the, the Democrats didn't really promote or accept that, did they? The local government didn't stop it. The Washington National Guard wasn't called in. That's and true. Inciting revolution, that's one of the top things the National Guard should do. Right. And they spoke out against it. And I went to a very, um, I went to a very progressive high school and everyone mm-hmm. in my high school was cheering on chat saying like, you gotta, it's like, okay to burn buildings. Okay. That's so, terrifying. Yeah, that was a big black pill for me on the left because I was a centrist at the time. And mm-hmm. seeing everyone in my high school who I trust out there were good people openly supporting political violence because this is the exact same people and the exact same stuff as what you're seeing with Hamas today. Right. That was a real wake up call for me. And then I went to Hype College, which is even more progressive. And I saw it even more deranged. And I just thought these people are insane. And then that's what moved me from being center to uh, part of the political right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah, Look, I mean, we had during World War Two. I mean, World War Two was happening before America ever got involved. I mean, you had I saw a thing the other day or heard a thing where they were talking about how Harvard was writing glowingly about Adolf Hitler. Yeah. So they got that one people. completely wrong. And I, I mean, just look at look at Ukraine. Look at uh, yeah. look at Israel, Palestine. Look at all this stuff that's going down and i just think i mean we could get drawn into that pretty quickly sitch so look my well, question is like what is like what first signs i feel like the first signs are are there for me i guess yeah, but, but okay you. let me answer that okay so there's a difficulty here too because i imagine that we could go back to like the 20s or some period of, or earlier some period of time where like the kkk was like big and there was a lot of energy and anger and animosity in the south i mean you literally had them running around like lynching you know black people and doing all that crazy shit and to me like you're living in that time period you're like wow we're like way closer to revolution than we are right now and yet there wasn't really a revolution that occurred right that all got basically stamped out i mean in the civil rights movement well even earlier but yeah then the civil rights i mean the thing that Sitch already said that he'll actually need to see the event to happen to convince him that it could happen. So, like, well, I kind of amended that. Like, if we start seeing things like the Chaz become common on the okay, right and okay. left, but, I mean, then I'm going to be like, oh fuck, we're predict, just, it's over. We do have factors that predict revolutions, and mm-hmm. we they they're true for almost all revolutions. And it's income inequality, um, average wages, and elite aspirants who are competing for good jobs. And the thing is we built a computer model that looks at those three variables and it can predict historical crises to the years they operate starting from those three variables. Mm -hmm. And that computer model said 15 years ago that we'd have a civil war in the 2020s. And so that sort of thing you look at and then in the upswing to the revolution, what you see is exactly what Adam said, people riding in the streets, little micro revolutions the inability to coordinate in anything where it's like i mean the thing is if you're in a happy marriage and you accidentally crash your car your wife's going to be going to be like oh i'm sorry honey we all make mistakes right if your marriage is really on the rocks and you crash your car <laughs> your wife will call you a complete idiot and scream at you right and so it, it's like you see how does your society deal with problems if COVID happened in the 50s there would be no issues. Everyone would listen to the government. There would be understanding. 
COVID totally. now, and it was mass polarization. And so it's stuff like that. And I mean, what Adam said, you've got wars around the planet. We had... Um, well, I mean, Pe- Pearl Harbor was what kicked, what got us involved in World War Two, And I'm just, I'm thinking like, if there was some kind of terrorist attack on par with September 11th, like, oh, it's over. We're like, we're jumping in with both feet. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's more difficult to predict international wars than it is to predict... Uh, civil wars and revolutions, because international wars tend to be predicated upon weird, complicated issues with the balance of power. And that's harder to read because for me, I mean, my theory of history is based off empathy. This is something you don't really talk about where the way I view the world is if I were to put myself in blank person's shoes with their cultural assumptions and where they're from, what would be the rational choices I make? And that's my theory of the world or how I use my tools. And the thing is that if it's easy to pick up on the vibes before a revolution, because they'd be like what they are today. If if I if you were to imagine what a society before a revolution would be like, you log into Twitter and you say, maybe we sh- like empathy is good. In a normal society, people reply, yeah, empathy is good. That's not a controversial society. It's not a controversial statement. In a society before a revolution, you get half a million views, of people calling you a cuck for saying empathy is good. <laughs> and it, that, I mean, it's like, Things like that, or in a society before revolution. That's so sad. If you're in a society before a revolution, you are scared to go to many major cities because law and order is broken down. Um, it's just, and you, you. I you, mean, I don't know if I'd be safe in Chicago right now, to be honest. With I mean, you. when I lived in Los Angeles, there were like loads of places where it didn't feel good. Oh, um, there are loads of places in Los Angeles that I would not go. No, yeah. definitely. And yeah. I mean, also. If you are in a society where you do not feel comfortable dating someone of the different political view or even having them as friends, that is a society at the verge of civil war. Yeah. Right. Well, but it's, if we transition, because I think a lot of this, um, a lot of this is predicated on on sort of Trump's polarization in existence. If, you know, in the, over the next four years, Trump Trump's wins or loses. Because of this. No, I'm, I I understand that. I agree. Yeah. But, but he definitely like turns it up. And I'm wondering if Trump, you know, because part of what we were talking about earlier is I'm wondering what the Republican Party is going to look like when Trump is gone after four years. And I'm wondering if when the four years come and go and Trump's either president, not president, he's gone. I do feel like the temperature is going to cool down substantially after that point. Why doesn't the removal of Trump just create more positions for chaos? I, um, I, that's what I worry What about. do you mean by rem- what do you mean? I mean, so like, for example, I had another tweet that did pretty well where I said, mm-hmm. um, Ben Shapiro is one of the best things to happen to the right because he's like an Austro-Hungary. He is an Ottoman Empire where you can quibble about Ben Shapiro himself. But if you remove Ben Shapiro, something much more monstrous will replace him. Ben Shapiro is this great stabilizer of sanity. And if you remove Ben Shapiro, he's replaced by something far like there will be wars over the position on the right and the power vacuum that if Ben Shapiro goes away. And that's with Trump. Trump is able Because I'm from Rust Belt, Pennsylvania. I completely understand Trump because my part of the country, all the factories left, all the jobs left, the people left, and no one in the government cared at all. And that is the resentment, a lot of the resentment behind Trump. And that resentment's still there. And Trump has proven that you can have a populist strong catalyzer. And and the thing is, if you remove Trump, it creates a competition match where people see this Trumpian base. And there's competition on who can be the mega Trump, who can take Trump's fire even more. So if you remove Trump, you create a competition system when people try to outcompete each other, become the most radical right winger to take Trump's base. Right. Well, I think, no, I definitely think that's going to happen. But I think what's, what's the way it's going to look is that I think Trump is a once in a lifetime personality. I don't think anyone's going to be able to emulate that successfully. They're going to try. Like and there's Lincoln? going to be. It might do a different thing, though. <laughs> and then, well, hold on. And then what's going to basically happen is you're going to, because the Republican Party overall has never really adopted the right populist um, positions. They're just kind of basically doing this facade of it in order to placate the Trump base. What are the Trump right base. populist positions? The anti-neoliberal, uh, neoconservative positions. Okay. Wait, wait, we only have about seven minutes left, guys. So just okay. I well, I'm just going to say, I, I don't think the Republican Party is really on board with a right wing populist message. That, I that we see. That. Right. But the, the old Republican establishment barely exists anymore. I mean, one of I don't know if I agree with that. Works. I think they're just kind of in hiding at the moment. 
Like, um, I have friends at the Hoover Institute, which is the top Republican think tank. Yeah. And what the Hoover Institute does is so removed from the actual Republican politics going on right now. The Republican establishment is not capable of energizing the public or having new, any new ideas. And I, what I see is that, um, I mean, I actually think Trump is a political genius. And I, in some ways, um, he's very foolish in others, but um, he's a political genius in several regards because he's able to build a broad coalition across the right without alienating many groups. Trump is able to energize a very diverse base of people around a shared group of messages. And those are messages that actually do benefit his base. Stuff like de- like reindustrialization, tariffs, um, um, the closing immigration, and the Trump presidency. Not I don't want to go on a MAGA rant here because that's not my brand. But the Trump presidency saw the fastest growth in lowest level income since the 60s, um, and which was since reversed afterwards. And so his stuff was helping his base. And like you look at reindustrialization has been happening because of it, and it's concentrated in the South and the Rust Belt. And so um, Trump did do things that supported his base. But he also, and so he was very good in that regard. Trump is a fire. He's very good at galvanizing support, but also he burns the other side. And so what Trump and inevitably did was he galvanized a base among his supporters, but he galvanized an even bigger oppositional base. And so he was able to energize the left against him more than he was able to energize the right in support of him. Mm-hmm. Okay. I mean, I don't disagree with any of that. Um, uh, I know I got to get going. Any right. last uh, points you guys want to make? Uh, I'm not. I'm not. What? What's that? What'd you say? Do you have any you last? Said should, points? You said I should get going in like five minutes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I, this is a fascinating conversation. Obviously, yeah. you're welcome to come back on, Roger. Thanks. We love. We love it's having you on. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for coming on. I'm glad you got to hang out with. I think before you sleep a bit. That was cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah. No, I look. I'm. I understand both of your perspectives. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, uh, yeah, no, I get it. I totally get it. So, I mean, we'll we're see, gonna find we'll see out. What so, who cares, right? Yeah, yeah and it, look, it's all gonna be over in ten years. We all we're agree gonna on that, find right? Out what's gonna happen? Like I don't, this, this ten years is like the next is the thing. Yeah, I mean, I'm this not is really the roaring twenties, guys. Look. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a real black pill for me because when I dropped out of school, I moved to Mexico, and I lived in Mexico. Um, 20 of my 20 of friends one of my friends organized it 20 other guys came down we went hard there then i came back from mexico we lived in mexico for three months and Mm -hmm. um, i went to new york thinking right after covid it would just be roaring 20s insane partying and there was a decent amount of partying but what i found was that after covid i thought there would just be this primal release of joy but the reality people stayed at home and what like scrolled through tiktok and there was never this like, oh my God, COVID's over, thank God moment. Um, and I think that speaks to, it speaks to something depressing in our society. Yeah, maybe. I hope I things uh, things get better though. So, but thanks Great. for coming bye. on. Thank you. We'll, uh, we'll talk again. Much. Okay, yeah. bye. Take care, man. Later. Hi, you just listened to a clip from the Sitch and Adams show. If you like what you heard, you can listen to our live show right here on this channel on Sunday, starting at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And if you want, you can super chat us. We read $20 and up super chats on the show and then do a follow-up stream on the following Tuesday where we read the rest of the unread super chats and interact with fans of the show. Subscribe to this channel right here to listen to the live show or to listen to more of our awesome clips.